Well, welcome back. I am delighted to now introduce you to Romy Kenyon, um, 3M Sustainability Manager. You've just heard from her on um, the panel earlier. Romy has 20 years experience in marketing strategy and sustainability in the paper industrial markets and 3M consumer business. Her role involves understanding customer needs for data, sustainability claims, roadmaps, and social sustainability, and working across departments to ensure 3M are ahead of legislation, anticipate trends, and work with like-minded suppliers, NGOs, and government agencies. So over to you, Romy. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction, and it's a privilege uh, to be here with you this morning. So today, I would like to try bring you into the journey that, sustain, that 3M has had with sustainability. Certainly the, the easy bits, um, and then definitely into the more difficult bits uh, for us. Um, for those of you not really familiar with, with 3M or, or maybe just with post-it notes, um, we have over 60,000 products. We are in healthcare, industrial, road traffic signs, uh, electronics. Uh, we are in lots of different markets besides consumer retail. And we have over 200 factories um, and we manufacture a lot. And we manufacture a lot of single use plastics as well. So sustainability from an early stage has been very important to us because as a manufacturer, we've been very aware since uh, back in 1975 that you know, the more pollution and emissions that you have, the more it's going to cost to clean it up. So it's much better not to do it in the first place. So we do have a great history of sustainability and trying to reduce the impact that we have on the, the planet. We also have a strategy um, called improving lives. And I think this brings in the holistic approach that we have to sustainability. It's not just about products. It's also about doing things in the right way. It's about having a positive impact on the communities where our factories or our offices are, as well as helping our customers achieve their sustainability goals and to have better products um, that can help uh, reduce the impact of, of climate change, um, products that can be recycled, um, and generally making people's lives better and easier um, in the world. And it's a very good time to be very involved in sustainability because I think, you know, if we step out of 3M for a minute, the, the world is very much at a, or two tipping points actually meeting. The first tipping point being the situation we find with our, our planet. The IPCC report came out in the summer, basically saying that maybe trying to keep global warming down to one and a half degrees is probably gone. We're now looking at two degrees, three degrees, four degrees. And we know many governments are now looking at how do we live in a world that could be at three or four degrees, uh, particularly with, you know, a third of the world will be inhabitable um, if we get to that limit. So that tipping point where we really have to make difficult decisions now, and especially in the run to COP, which is only five weeks away, hoping that governments will commit uh, to some very difficult targets and hope we, we get there. But I think there's another tipping point as well, and that's the business tipping point, where I think we are seeing that for not just manufacturers, but anyone in business, you know, you will do better, you will have more opportunities, you will have more sales, more profitability by seriously addressing sustainability and the issues with climate, then ignoring it or just doing very little with it. So I think thinking about those two tipping points is a good way to start um, today and to think about the journey 3M has been on and maybe help others uh, to get on that same journey if they're not already. If to know 3M is certainly to know a little bit of how we, we operate. We are all about the science. Uh, we are run by scientists, uh, really. We are very clever in our labs and have come up with lots of different types of materials and chemicals that we are able to put into lots of different technologies and markets. And that's really been our strength. Uh, innovation is at the heart of what we do, but our values drive us as well. You know, not just the ones of diversity, equity, inclusion, which are very important to us, but how we behave, the people that work with us, how they behave. So the way we pick 
our suppliers and work with them. But sustainability is definitely a driving force of everything that we do uh, in, in our businesses and with our customers. We'd like to describe ourselves as a 3M, as a purpose-driven uh, company. And when I said at the beginning, the easy parts, this may be is the easy part, the, the global strategies that you have, the vision of what we want to do, making ESG a priority. You know, our, our CEO will regularly talk about that we, you know, innovation that doesn't have sustainability is not innovation, that growth will come because of sustainability. So that, that's all wonderful. We have a sustainability framework. So a science for circular, looking at how we keep new, our, um, our assets in the marketplace longer so they're not going to landfill, they're not being incinerated, how we do more with less. We have science for climate, where we look at how we can reduce our impact on the planet through what we do in our, our factories and the investments we make there. But it's also about our products and developing products that will uh, have a positive impact on the planet. So particularly where we're involved with renewable energies and components for that. And I think the last part, the science for community is also very important. Uh, we know consumers um, and, and our, our customers, be they distributors or people using our products as components for their products, they need to know they're working with a company that's doing the right thing, that they care about the community, that in 3M doing well and making money, that we do good with that as well. And that just 3M being successful has a positive impact on the planet as well. Like most companies, we have goals. We have goals for 2025, for 2030, going out to 2050. Um, so we intend to be net zero uh, by 2050. Um, and the problem with that is uh, listening to IPCC again, that is just not good enough. And, you know, being very honest um, about it, we know how we can get to net zero 80% of it by 2050. The other 20% we don't really know at this stage. It means we are utterly dependent on technology innovation to get us down that last road. Now, the good news there is we believe in technology and innovation and we believe we will be able to bring this target in and looking at our factories and sites in, in Europe, we are ahead of our 2025 goals and, and leading the way in, in that area. But there is no doubt these goals that we have and many other companies uh, like us, it is going to be very tough for us to hit those targets, but we're not one to give up on a, on a tough challenge. And we have very strong goals um, that we want to achieve. I just mentioned the net zero one, but we also have targets in renewable energy, in water, uh, that, that we need to address as well. And we know we won't hit these targets without uh, working with partnerships that we have, like the UNFCCC, the uh, Global Compact is there with the Sustainable Development Goals. And we are a patron um, of this with the UN as well, which means that we really go out of our way to help um, our suppliers and our customers to embed the thinking behind the sustainability development goals into their processes as well. So we can show real leadership there. But what I will say is that's kind of the easy bit, easy bit, you know, setting goals and having strategy, you know, a global initiative to put in your sustainability report or have your CEO talk about, that is definitely um, the easy, easy bit. The harder bit is how you make this work uh, for your customers and make a difference uh, for, for them. And one of the ways we have tried to do that is through embedding sustainability into every new product that we have. So going back about two, three years, we started a new initiative where every new product that we have will have a sustainability value commit commitment. So this is something that we can uh, calculate and sort of add up the sales and see, you know, and another reason for that tipping point, knowing that investing in sustainable products and promoting them is far better than, than not doing so. 
Um, so every product that has been launched in the last three years has had a sustainability value commitment. And this can be anything from what the product is made of, that it can be recycled or there's a take back scheme with it. It can be that it lasts longer or that parts of it can be fitted with, with a new part, like a filter, for example, so that the product can last longer. So lots of different ways we can look at a product to make sure that value commitment is, is in there. So we have lots of global strategic priorities. Uh, one of the key things we have tried to, to do is definitely tell um, our stakeholders, be it investors, uh, be it our suppliers or our customers, the good things that we are doing and encourage them to do the same and to, you know, to help them uh, get better at sustainability as well. And one of the things we will be doing, uh, we will be at COP um, in, in five weeks time uh, and trying to promote that leadership position that, that, that we want to have. And it is very difficult for a company like 3M because we're a manufacturer and it's very easy for somebody like a Microsoft or a Facebook that really are dealing with, with software and online they, they have problems for sure, but it's a lot less than having to deal with the very, very complicated supply chains that we have. So we are hoping at COP um, to announce a strategic partnership with the UNFCCC. Um, so this is on, on specifically on climate change to show that even a manufacturer as old and longstanding as we are, even though we are based Yes, in Europe, where we have lots of renewable energy and lots of support to do the right thing and, and legislation to support that. But where we are in countries that maybe don't um, have access to a lot of renewable energy, like APAC um, countries, or there isn't the legislation, or they actively go against the legislation like Brazil, um, that we are still investing and trying to do the right thing there. Um, our strategy in Science for Circular Climate and Community, which I mean I won't go into detail today, we have made huge strides on and working very closely with our customers, uh, particularly in the product development side of that, and sort of coming up with services, schemes, and different business models that will really help them there and being able to talk about the progress we're making on and their commitments. So I would say we're doing really well, ticking all the boxes on, on that. But it really is this middle one. Uh, so in terms of a strategic uh, priority, how we can be relevant to our different market sectors all around the world and make life better and easier for our customers in particular. And one of the reasons uh, for that is that our customers have become a lot more demanding. One of the reasons for that is legislation. Um, the Green Deal uh, and you know the corresponding 10-point plan for industrial revolution that the uh, that Boris announced uh, two years ago, uh, which is very, very similar, are driving change at lots of level. We're, we're seeing it in things like the single-use plastic tax uh, and EPR that we discussed earlier, but there's a lot on the waste directive, circular economy, uh, chemical strategy, pollution. Uh, which applies right across Europe, UK as, as, as well. And that is driving change. It means our customers are demanding from him, what are you going to do 3M that is going to help us um, here? So in terms of regulation, which we definitely touched on earlier on today, one of the big things coming is this mandatory non-financial reporting that many companies in the UK had to deal with for the first time uh, this year. And that can be very difficult. What what are you talking about when you talk about non-financial reporting? Are you just reporting about one particular country? Uh, is it your worldwide operations? What do you do? We have lots and lots of global data on everything. Uh, not a problem. But if you want to make it specific, so a customer buying office products and only office products, they don't really care um, about uh, what we're doing in the electronics industry or the healthcare industry. They want that data and that can be really tricky uh, for us. Uh, extended producer responsibility, whilst we have been aware, no, it's coming, we find it quite complicated in terms of all the different regulation in all the different countries and getting that right. We're also finding that the 
not just getting the right data, but inputting that data in the, the right way is a problem as well, because all the different systems are different and there's a cost associated with that. What, whilst we have the data in a format, it would be fantastic if we could just upload that into the different systems and make life easy. But I think it, we are a little bit away from that. Single use plastic tax. Again, this is something that we probably welcome because it's focusing us to change um, our, 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 our packaging, uh, which is something we did want to do. But there's a cost associated with that. Of course, there is. You know, there is no doubt a fast plastic packaging line will do a lot more boxes uh, than trying to fold cardboard boxes uh, and get them ready for, uh, to, to send off. Um, so it's been a very good way for us to justify uh, some of the changes that we want to make. Other things that are coming and we have to be aware of is the uh, green labeling um, that will be coming through. Uh, and that will be on, on products as well as packaging. And we will need the data to, to go with that. So sort of the green passporting that you might have heard of. We also know that substances are being looked at um, within the EU and the UK as well such things as banning PVC. Uh, we've made great strides in taking PVC packaging uh, away, but being honest, we do have PVC uh, in many of our products. You know, we will have to think in a very different way, uh, particularly because many of 3M's products are designed to be used once for, for very good reason, uh, particularly with contamination and, and thinking about pandemics, but we can't do that moving forward. And I, I think with all of that, you know, we're having to go through all this regulation, but so do our customers. They're having to report as well. And they need the data from us because they've got to do uh, their reporting. So we are seeing huge amount of supplier audits coming our way. And the big problem for us is not one supplier does an audit or a questionnaire in the same way. And it would be brilliant if there was some way, even by trade body or by market, that we could have some consistency on how an audit for a supplier could look like, because I then think we'd get much better quality of responses um, that our customers and suppliers would be able to do something with and be better able to compare and contrast uh, different companies. So that would be something we would love um, to see. Another difference um, that we see is that many of our customers now have their own sustainability goals. Uh, some of these would be big brands. Some of these would be customers trying to differentiate themselves in a, a, a busy marketplace. A lot um, of our customers do have net zero targets um, and way better than ours. They, they're coming in at 2030, 2035, 2040, 2045. And whilst we will do our best uh, and seriously, um, to improve the 2050 target. We do question some uh, of our customers, do they really know how they're going to, to get uh, to their net zero target in the time scale that they've said, um, particularly when it's so difficult to measure what we call scope three emissions. So our scope three, you know, once it leaves our factory, how our customers use it, you know, do they know how good that data is it does highlight the need for them to work with suppliers that will be able to help them and give them the, the good data um, as we move forward. We do know our customers are very concerned about waste and reducing waste and a lot have zero landfill, landfill targets, which is fantastic, but also it does cost them even to send waste away that they know can be recycled. So the more we can do to reduce the more we can do to make it easier for them to be able to get product recycled and get it recycled at a cheaper rate, um, the better that will be. Uh, many of our customers have a goal um, that they want everything uh, that goes out the waste would be suitable for recycling. And that can be the cap ends of, of rolls, it can be the wrapping, inner cores, um, as well as all the, the packaging. So. The, the what happens at end of life is becoming extremely important for us because of the pressure being put on our on us by our customers. We have many customers uh, that have science based targets um, and I'll be honest, uh, 3M are working towards that. We are not 
there yet, but it is our plan to, to get there. Um, but where we do have customers that have signed up to science-based target, well, they're going to be very tough um, on, on, on us as a supplier. And we work very hard with, with these customers to make sure that we are giving them the best and appropriate data that we can, knowing that that isn't you know where it should be just yet but we are trying to put the systems in place and to try and understand what is it they really want to measure what is it they really need to to improve so that is us reducing our scope one and scope two but there's a whole new criteria really for us in terms of activity on the scope three area and this is why it's really important for us to understand what customers do with our products how they use our products what happens at end of of life so that we can work with them to have better products um, and come up with other ways that will contribute much, much better to their, or to our scope three, their scope one and two emissions. So sorry to talk scopes. Um, and I think the other side of it then is embedding social value um, into our activities. I, I did mention that it's, it's great 3M doing well, making money, but we need to do something with that to truly be a business with a purpose we have to do good because we're doing well helping communities and some of the the obvious ones have have been most recently with um, some of the the climate change issues in terms of, of hurricanes earthquakes where uh, we've given lots of, of um, protection and respirator product uh, free um, to disaster zones but i think even lower down, we have to help communities, but even more of that, if you buy uh, 3M scotch or 3M post-it notes, is there a way the consumer can do good um, for a community with buying our product? And a good way to explain that probably is, you remember um, a number of years ago, Pampers had a great campaign where if you bought a packet of Pampers that you were helping vaccinate babies in developing countries. And for a lot of mothers who are vaccinating their own uh, babies and knowing the difference that makes to their lives or you know, understanding that to be able to vaccinate in a developing country where they don't have the facilities to do that made them feel good buying the, the product, but they did good because they bought the, the product and it maybe changed their buying preference because of that. And embedding that social value into our products is something we are taking very seriously now. Uh, we have a few pilots um, on, on the go at the moment that I can't really talk about at th this time, but maybe next year I'll be able to say how successful um, they were. And I, I think the last part then is a lot of our customers will use sustainability for differentiation and to get that customer preference. Many want to be seen as a sustainability leader and many of them really are. Um, so part of that is supplier qualifying, um, which is not an easy process. And if you qualify once, it doesn't mean they're not going to give you stricter and harder targets. It usually means that we need to provide baseline data from anything from carbon footprint to uh, the water usage, emissions. But it also generally means that they want a detailed roadmap. Where are we going to, to go with that? And that's a bit hard for, for 3M. Not that we don't have the, the roadmaps, but being that honest um, about where we're going and what we're doing and admitting where the issues are. And I think that's one of the big changes we're going to see. Uh, with, with sustainability. I was at a meeting yesterday where a, a few banks and investors were there too, and their biggest complaint was they can get now data, they can read sustainability reports, they, they can see everything that has happened, but the projections for the future on non-financial things, they find very difficult to, to get. And for them, you know, they want to invest in the companies that are going to do the right thing, understand how difficult it is going to be. They need that data. So I'm hoping that collectively, all companies will be a lot better at sharing where they're going, how they're going to, to, to achieve net zero, and maybe get away from what we're beginning to call as, as net zero washing. Um, you know, that the, the plans that we have, it's very clear how we're going to all get there. 
So part of market differentiation has got to be certifications and claims. And a lot of our customers are very demanding here. Some certifications like PEFC or SC, so you know that all your card and paper is coming from sustainable forests. You know that this is big work to get. You you don't just sign up to this. Uh, this is something you have to be approved uh, and be audited on every year. So it is not an easy thing to do. It is not a cheap thing to do. But it shows the commitment uh, of many of our customers that they insist. Um, that their suppliers achieve this certification, which also means that they are not going for cheapest supplier either. It, it demonstrates they want to show change and they want to invest in sustainability. Uh, also mention uh, EPD. This is um, the Environmental Product Declaration. This is a system we use a lot in construction, uh, but we are beginning to see it in coming into other markets. So it's a way for the consumer to compare and contrast different products and pick the most environmentally least impact solution. So if you were going to cover a wall, you could use paint, you could use wallpaper, you could use um, a graphic print, you know, but which one, you know, will have the least impact on the, on the planet. So you would be able to compare those and any other uh, technology and then make the decision based on that. So a little bit like the food labeling we see with the traffic light system, where you can see oh, too much salt, too much sugar and, and make decisions. Uh, you know, this is something that we may see in the future um, as a way for for consumers to, to, to decide. Another way that consumers do decide is with eco labels. Um, Yes, we do see labels with green leaves on them, um, but also there are ones like the Blue Angel, Nordic Swan, where they're all audited. Again, you can't use these symbols unless you have signed up and been approved um, to use them. So data needed to prove that. There are lots and lots of eco labels out there. We can't possibly sign up to all of them. But I think as a, a, an industry, we need to sit down and decide which the ones are going to be most useful to consumers and the most recognized ones that we should all be supporting. So work to do on that yet. Just to talk about some of our, our, our customers, um, and I've just picked on these for no particular reason. Um, many of our customers are, are, are quite tough on us. But it is just to highlight, you know, the pressure they put on us each year to achieve the standards that they want, and then the following year to, to achieve in higher standards. So with these and with other companies, they are auditing us every year. Uh, they are making environmental marketing claims themselves. They cannot make them unless they have proved that either we've got the certifications or the audit trail um, to, to prove that, um, or you know that they they have absolute proof that we are doing what we say we are doing, and we make sure that we do that every year. The main focus areas tend to be on third party certificate claims. So this is where the products come from, uh, particularly uh, card and forestry uh, products. Uh, responsible wood sourcing is part of that as well. But social responsibility and audits associated with that are becoming uh, very much a thing as well. So that's about you know how we run our factories. Do we have a modern slavery uh, policy? And if we do, well, how do they know that we we actually adhere to that. Who's auditing that to make sure we are doing th things in the right way? Um, do we have labor policies? Are we looking at diversity and ethics? How do we treat disabled people within our, our, our factories or, or in our offices? And they really do want this information, um, you know, and, and signed off by somebody they care about, not just 3M saying, look, of course we, we, we do that. So it's a lot harder to, to please our customers than it would have been in the in the past. And this is in addition to having the, the right product um, that they would have insisted on in the past as well. So I have to say our, our, our customers do drive a lot of change and are helping uh, to, to, to change uh, the world for consumers. If we come back to 3M and to look at our, our businesses, um, and if I look at our consumer business in, in particular, with all the different things going on, how is that impacting 
their approach and our approach to sustainability, particularly as you know, we wanted to show where innovation comes in and how that makes a, a difference. So all of our businesses are, are facing the, these costs with the single use plastic packaging tax, extended producer responsibility, the mandatory sustainability labeling, uh, returns policy um, is, is one becoming a, a, an issue in many countries at the moment. Um, and this is, you know, traditionally, if, if product was the wrong product or damaged product or the customer didn't want that product, it was always probably cheaper to just destroy that than bring it back to our warehouse and, and do something with it and make sure where it was, was kept in the right conditions, etc. Uh, but many countries are beginning to outlaw that. And if you think about things, you know, that's just wasteful, isn't it? But it is a decision many of us make it in manufacturing and distribution to, to do that. So we are having to look at our returns policy. What could we do instead? Could we give the product to charities, to schools, universities? Would that not be a much better thing to do? Um, so that is definitely something that we will look at and again, be ahead of, of legislation um, and then we need to be. But I think it makes our customers quite happy to know that just because they didn't want the product or we sent them the wrong product that you know we're not causing a, a lot of waste or destruction uh, just because it, it suited us. So with all this regulation going on across the EU, across the UK, you know, yeah, definitely increased costs, but I think we're trying to look at it as more as an opportunity for us to do things differently, but also I think our customers are wanting us to do things um, in, a, in a different way. We are also getting a huge amount of customer requests for data, uh, detailed assessments. Um, I did mention that they are never in the same format uh, and asking the same thing in a slightly different way. Or if we don't answer it the way they've put the question, they're not happy. So we have a big mess with how we do requests and, and to look maybe by industry a way that we can harmonize these for the good of everybody and to make sure that we are getting the best data, the right data that people can then work with. Um, one of the things we're working with at the minute is um, with EPR and uh, Valpac in putting all the data about our products. So each individual customer will say, can you input into Valpac for us? You know, if we're selling, you know, over a hundred products to a customer and then all the different SKUs with that, Oh, there can be thousands of lines and someone's got to input that. So that's proving to be a real issue. We, we know if this year is the issue after that, it'll be far more straightforward. But we do need to think of, of, of ways, particularly now we have, we have lots of technology, we should be able to input data in a better, quicker way, probably eliminating quite a lot of mistakes uh, and, and giving everyone a, a better idea, better baseline of where we are. So that's customer requests. We've got then product data and then the roadmaps people want. So we get a lot of requests for our carbon footprint or our manufacturing footprint. The problem for that for us is, is where do you start? Where do you stop? Um, and many of our products are made in, in factories all over the world. Um, how do we slice and dice the data uh, for our customers? We know our customers want to compare and contrast different suppliers. So how do they compare one making a whole load of different products with one that is just making products for the, the, the office, just making pens for, for example. Um, but this is something that we have to get right and we are definitely looking into to that. We have made great strides on getting transportation data, getting packaging data, and we can do product data through life cycle assessments. But that is a big amount of work. It can take us six to nine months to get all the data we need for a life cycle assessment. Um, and we're going to have to find ways uh, to make that faster. But of course, data is only the baseline. Uh, the roadmaps then and commitments come with that. So that's something else that we have to try get right uh, for our, our, our customers. And then finally, you know, we, we need um, the products 
to, to go with that. So I'll speed up because I think I'm beginning to run out of time. So I'm not going to go through all the different products that we have, just to highlight the move to recycled paper, the, the use of the PEFC uh, certified um, sign because we, we've uh, qualified for that. Different types of adhesive made from plant uh, rather than fossil fuels. Uh, and also um, a new thing, you know, looking at our packaging to make sure it's easier to recycle. So using one color ink, for example, to help that, that process. Um, lots of the products that we have now have this uh, sustainability value commitment so we have things like recycled notes that are made from 100 percent recycled paper we have tried to eliminate as much of the plastic as we have whilst also understanding what our customers need so looking at the the scotch tape there and the plastic dispenser trying to make sure that says um made from recycled content or uh, can be recycled, you could ask why have we even got it there in the first place, but we do know our customers do like to use these and more tape gets wasted if we don't have a dispenser to, to go with. And there is a picture there, you can see the sort of faded out post-it note of where the mono ink ha has come, come in. Um, so lots of innovation in our packaging, but also within the products um, as well. So one of the things that we've tried to do, understanding that our customers do like the dispensers, that can we do it in a way that there aren't three dispensers in, in, in a pack, that they can just reload that dispenser for them, uh, which is, is, is good to know um, uh, as well. So lots of progress being made um, on, on our products there. Um, just sort of to finish up, you know, part of what we are trying to do is not just packaging focus, but to make sure the products that will come through um, and end of life associations with them will be better as well. So we use this kind of template with our R&D teams to make sure we're thinking of all aspects of sustainability. And really then just uh, my final thoughts on, on, on this, there is definitely an urgency for all of us to do a lot more and a lot quicker. 3M have invested a billion dollars to accelerate it, our environment, um, environmental goals. We know it's not going to be enough, but we have to focus on these scope three goals and that is working far more closely with our customers. We do know science and technology will save the day and we are certainly you know, investing um, innovation is what we do and innovation comes from collaboration and working with people as well. We have to decarbonize the supply chain. We can't do it on our own. Uh, we have to work with other parties to do that. So my final thought would be, we have to work together and we have to share the issues. That's the only way we can, can solve them. Any questions at this stage? Thank you so much for that, Romy. <clears throat> that was really insightful and sounds to me like um, you're saying a collaborative approach is key across all sectors with clear communication on vision, um, commitments and data um, to help everyone meet their targets and drive that change. Definitely. And um, we've got a few questions in, so let me just take a look and I'll get right. So just to kick off, um, oh, this is, so I've, I've visited 3M's Innovation Centre um, and it's brilliant. Um, a question, what sustainable product or packaging innovation um, is 3M or yourself more, most proud of or one you'd like to highlight to the audience? Oh, the one I'd really <laughs> like to highlight is the one I can't talk about. Oh, I thought, I thought you, when you said earlier, there were some things you couldn't reveal. I was like, I bet it's going to be one of them. Yeah, um, and often innovation happens because we get it wrong. And uh, we got this really clever thing over from, from the US. And we were, we can't use that in Europe, it's not recyclable. So we sent it back. And they have come back with something that we believe, we're, like post-it notes change the world. Uh, we have something in packaging that will change the world, but I cannot say just okay, yet. Okay, right, so we're all gonna have to watch this space then. Yes, okay. there is a, a new thing. And I think it might even be called post-it, I'm not, not sure. Uh, okay. But it is packaging related um, rather than the office. Okay, brilliant. Well, we'll we'll watch out for that one then with bated breath. Um, another question that's come through: um, How do 3M ensure they bring all stakeholders on their sustainability journey with them? So that's a very good question. Um, we 
work very closely partnerships are a good way um, to do that and then you can bring um, particularly with the UN partnership we can bring people from R&D um, sort of higher up in the organization to that and we like to bring in our customers with that we run sustainability workshops um, well at least we did um, before <laughs> COVID took over in our innovation centers and we try to bring a, a whole supply chain um, to that so it could be you know the raw material manufacturer us um, and then various customers or distributors that are using that and sit in a room and figure out what are the big problems, what could we work on together and then get a project um, out of that. And that's a very good way to, to understand other people's problems because all of us think generally about what we, we think is the problem for everybody else, but to hear it firsthand and what people are doing um, is, is a great way um, to do that. So I think just being in the same room, and I think we can't wait till the Innovation Centre can be open again, which hopefully is quite soon, you know, and to to bring um, as many of the people watching today, you know, if you have an interest, we would love to have you in our Innovation Centre and also uh, to have you as part of a workshop. Brilliant. Now, I mean, I'd highly endorse it. If you get a chance, anyone um, watching, if you get a chance to visit 3M's Innovation Centre, um, jump at it. It's brilliant. Um, another question we've had come through, we did actually touch on this earlier today in um, our panel session, um, and it's regarding the pandemic, and it's asking whether um, 3M saw a change in attitude towards sustainability demands um, and also a change in request to data. Um, throughout COVID-19? Absolutely. Um, I said earlier that we thought it might just stop, you know, just let everyone get back on their, their feet. But no, I think many industries, many markets, many of our customers see bringing those plans forward as the way to get back, um, you know, be, to be economically viable again, to see innovations coming through. They've had lots of time, I think, to, to think. And yes, lots of time to to think about what suppliers they want to work with, what will make a difference in their markets. And that difference is down to sustainability. And that's what I meant by the, this tipping point being there now. Um, and, it, and it's moved away from having a policy or saying you do this. It's the, well, show me how you do that. How, how is that going to happen? You know, what are your proof points? Uh, which I think is a, is a good thing. Um, so sustainability is is definitely being accelerated and we're seeing it come from all levels, from the investors, um, various parts of the supply chain, definitely from consumers, uh, definitely from millennials and, and down to the point where you don't want to be that company that is being highlighted for the wrong reason. So, you know, thank goodness, because we, we need that. And I think with COP coming up, you know, we need, you know, some commitments from government to, to really drag everyone further and faster uh, than we have been. Absolutely. Thank you. And I think we've probably got time just for one more question. And um, that is, so 3M, obviously very large company. Um, for any SMEs on the call, can you give them any advice on where to kind of start their journey or progress it? Well, I think that the first point is to get that baseline data what is it you don't know what do you need to measure because you can't improve unless you have a starting point and without that starting point you can't really put the the goals in so getting that baseline data is absolutely important um, do a materiality study it doesn't have to be an official one just you know sitting in that that room and thinking about what do your stakeholders really care about uh, and make sure you've highlighted that and linked it to to your baseline and then I would say, you know, who are you going to work with to, to learn more and, and to get some strategies in, in place and, and help you get some wins? It, it is very easy to be overwhelmed by what needs to be done, but you're still better off starting and getting on that, that road. You know, it's, it's all little chunks, really, but do collaborate, speak to others. Lots of bigger companies will help, uh, including 3M, you know, to, to give you the information. We know companies like Microsoft are really stretching to, to help companies get the data they need uh, to, to do sustainability in, in a better way and get those baseline. So reach out to companies, the help is there. 
Brilliant. Oh, I think people will appreciate hearing that. Um, well, thank you so much. It's been really great to hear 3M's vision um, and understand how you guys embed sustainability in all you do. Um, next up, we have Stefan Casey from Nestle. Um, he's going to be exp explaining how to innovate in a ever-changing world. That will be on at 11.20. So all that's left to say is thank you so much, Romy, for your time. Mm. Um, we hope you'll stick around with us and to see everyone back here at 11.20.